Welcome to Work Matters, where we explore what leaders can do to make work more productive, valuable, meaningful, and impactful. I am your host, Thomas Bertels. In today's episode of the Work Matters podcast, I'm talking with Dennis Adsit about employee development and something he calls the generosity gene. Dennis is an executive coach with deep expertise in developing leaders, building high-performing teams, and aligning culture to improve execution. He earned a PhD in industrial psychology from the University of Minnesota before working as an HR director for a tech company. He then moved into management consultant, working with Aeon and advising leading Fortune 100 companies on how to deploy Six Sigma and other large-scale change programs. He then moved on to Intuit, where as a senior vice president, he first led process excellence and later on the call center organization. And he also has experience as a startup investor and executive. So Dennis brings a wealth of experience to benefit his clients. In today's conversation, we'll unpack why leaders should care about employee development. We talk about the benefit of having a mental model for their role in the process. Dennis then walks us through his mental model, his five levers that managers can use to accelerate employee development. We'll talk about the power of generosity as a meta skill and multiplier. And we'll end with a conversation on how to get started and what outcomes to expect. I hope you enjoy this conversation. And if you do, please like, subscribe, and share. Dennis, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Thomas. Pleasure to have you on. I've been looking forward to this. We've been talking about this for a while. So in, in this episode, we want to uh, talk about, on the headline of the generosity gene, we want to talk about what leaders can do to develop their people. But before we dive into the how, let's talk about the why. Right? Yeah. Why, why should leaders care? What are the benefits besides feeling good about yourself? Uh, what's in it for the leader? Let, let's start with a lofty, right? There, there are some leaders out there that are interested in their legacy, right? They're interested in leaving behind people that can carry on the work and continuity. Um, a successor, for example, uh, is often a focus for some leaders. So that's a lofty reason to do it. But a lot of leaders are under the gun, let's face it. And uh, they have more immediate needs. And one of those immediate needs is more outputs from the team. And, and that's kind of what your podcast is all about. How do we, you know, refashion work so people enjoy the work that they're doing so that they can be more productive? Well, one of the ways they can be more productive is if they have more skills, if they've developed themselves in some way and they can apply those learnings to the work that they're doing. So that's kind of a, a second more immediate reason. Another one is turnover, right? They say that people don't leave companies, they leave managers. And one of the reasons they leave managers is that they feel they're not growing. And so another kind of self-serving reason why a manager might want to think about the development of his or her people is how they can help them grow so that they stick around. Because I, I think turnover is like the battery acid that eats away at team and organizational effectiveness. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. I think, uh, I think one of the issues with turnover is there's no line item on the PL, right? That really quantifies how significant it is, right? And, and so I think yeah. a lot of leaders, they fly blind. Let's talk about uh, uh, mental models, right? In, in, your, in one of your recent black, uh, blog posts, you argue that when it comes to people development, people, most leaders really don't have a, a way to think about it, a mental model, right? Why does that matter? Yeah, I, I'm huge on mental models. I, I've been this way for a long time. And, and I think of a mental model as like a map. It's like a, it's like a compression of how does this thing work? How, like you have a map to get someplace, you know, it's like it's, that's not actually how you get there, but it's a map which describes how to get there. Um, my advisor in graduate school used to say that the wrong model about a situation is better than not having a model. And the reason he said this was if you take a wrong model and you start applying it or testing it, you'll figure out what parts of it don't work. And then you can update this model of how things work based on your learnings. 
So I start my classes on this topic. I ask people, imagine that you had to go to a, you know, an, an evening MBA program and teach a group of rising executives, or maybe they are already executives and they're just working on getting their MBA. You had to teach them how to develop your people. What would you say? And most people have never thought about this, Thomas. They've never thought about, well, here's kind of the four ingredients or the two ingredients, or here's the most important thing you have to do to develop your people. And so when they have to think about teaching a class, this is the first time they've written it down. And what that means is that lots of times, if there is development occurring, it's kind of random or happening by chance, if you will. I think that's really insightful. And, and you're right, right? And, uh, and, unless you would have to teach it, nobody would really right, intentionally think about it. Yeah. Um, so you have a mental model for developing people. Right? So, so pray tell us, what are some of the levers that you think leaders can and should pull? Yeah, let me, let me start with the, the foundational element, the cornerstone of this model. So the cornerstone of this model is that leaders don't actually develop their people. The people develop themselves. But if the manager or the leader doesn't do certain things, doesn't create the right conditions or the right container, then the learning is, is, is going to, there's going to be more friction or it's not going to happen as rapidly or as effectively. So the manager has a role, but I want to be unequivocally clear, people develop themselves. And I think that's a key part of the message that leaders need to deliver. In fact, that's really the first element of my model beyond that foundational piece is that, okay, people develop themselves. Then what's the role of the leader for this very first element of the model? And there's five, help your people be intentional, help them be intentional about what they want to learn. Uh, I take you Thomas as an example, right? So you wrote your first book in your 20s. You got an MBA at night while you were still working. You know, you've written another book. You did all those things on your own. You drive your own. You, you have driven your own development. You did have a manager that was pushing you to do that. Right. But you were intentional about what it was that you want to do. And I think that's what managers can do. Reed Hoffman wrote this book called The Alliance. And in it, he said managers should talk to their employees about the work that they're doing in like this kind of tour of duty concept, right? Okay, we've got this project. It's going to last three months or it's going to last six months or it's a big one. It's going to last 18 months. What do you as the employee want to get out of this? Imagine you're doing a tour in Afghanistan or Iraq or, you know, wherever the military is serving. What do you want to learn from this tour? You're asking the employee to be intentional about that. And I think that's a powerful first step. And one of the reasons it's powerful is that once the employee is intentional about it, it helps you to be able to give feedback to that employee. I had a client of mine that was going in to share some feedback, uh, share his own 360 feedback and get some advice from a C-suite executive. And the C-suite executive said to him, before I can give you any advice, I need to know what you're aiming at. You know, do you want to be more of a generalist or do you want to be a specialist? Do you want this level or that level? Once I know what you're aiming at, I can tailor my feedback for you. So that's the first one. Help the employees to be intentional about what they want to learn. And let me, let me stop there and just see what your reactions are. No, I think that's very interesting. It, I think it also honestly applies to leaders too. Mm. Learning from a colleague of mine, Steve Crum, right? We both know very well. Yes. Um, he's the one that introduced me to this idea of like asking the leader at the beginning of the project, all right, what, what's in it for you? Mm. Why are you excited about this project? What do you want to get out of it? And, and, and so I think, and that was always a very powerful question that unlocked a lot of really good dialogue. And to your point, people oftentimes don't even reflect on it. Yeah. They look at this work just comes their way instead of seizing sort of the opportunity in that space. Okay, yeah. I'm sold. Step one, intentionally. What, 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 yeah. what comes next? Okay, well, I just want to point out that the first question you asked me on this podcast was asking what's in it for the leader, right? So you, you uh, walked your talk on, uh, on that question because that's how you started this off. Here. So, okay, so the first one is be intentional. So now the person says, this is what I want to kind of get out of the next six months or I want to get out of this project, however long it's going to last, et cetera. The second 
element of my model of the how leaders create the conditions for development is you have to give your employees a target. Now, this might sound a little counterintuitive because like, don't we all have targets? Don't we all have numbers that we're running after and deadlines and things like that? We all have those things. But the target I'm talking about is laying out what, uh, call it good, better, best looks like or not acceptable, acceptable and great, you know, whatever mile posts you want to put in there, but some way of describing what it is that we're looking for from this job. Back in the early 2000s, Ben Horowitz, who's now a VC with Andreessen Horowitz, I'm sure you're aware, uh, he was so frustrated with the product managers that he was working with that he wrote a post, or it probably was a paper at the time and now it's posted. It's called Good Product Manager, Bad Product Manager. And in this post, he wrote this post like he was training his dog. Like when your dog brings you your slippers, you say, good dog. You know, when your dog, you know, pees on the carpet, you say, bad dog, right? So he was looking at his product manager and say, this is, this is when you're a good product manager. This is when you're a bad product manager. This post is close to 25 years old, Thomas. It is still downloaded hundreds of times because people are so desperate to know what does good look like? So in the language of Six Sigma, which is something you and I are both familiar with, if we can describe this good, better, best, I like to think about those as the X's that lead to the Y's. If we do these things to this standard, then we should get the outcomes that we're looking for. So that's how I think about the second one. Once you've established this and had the conversation with the employee about what good, better, best looks like, A developmental accelerant is if you can role model at least some of the employee's job, what great looks like. I'm not saying you have to do the, be able to do the employee's job, but if, for example, being a good storyteller is important, it would be good if you were a good storyteller or if, you know, being good at influence or change management was something that was important. If you could role model some of that, you're just going to accelerate things for your employees. Otherwise, they have to go and figure it out someplace else, right? And the last point here is it makes the performance review a lot easier, right? We talked about good, better, best. And clearly, we didn't see that on this particular project or in this aspect of the project. Why didn't it happen? What got in the way? What can we do differently next time? So let me stop there with the second one. Giving employees a target that's not numerical. I like that. I think it it, it ties to an idea that uh, I learned from another person we know in, we have in common, uh, Bob Aubrey, right? Who, yes. who talks about don't have key performance indicators, have key development indicators. Beautiful. Okay. Intentionality, right? Define what good looks like, good, better, best. Yep. What, what's next? What's next? Okay, the third one, and this is one of my favorites and return to it probably at the end, but I think a third level or third element of this model of developing your employees is to run your operating reviews like dojos that are learning grounds and that create a feeling of co-opetition. Sorry, what's a dojo? Uh, yes, a dojo is like where you study karate or you study Judo, in my case, I have a black belt in Aikido, so I studied Aikido in a dojo. So a dojo is like a place for learning a martial art. Have you ever have you ever studied a martial art or been in a dojo? No. Okay. Well, here's some characteristics of a dojo. First of all, there's lots of people to learn from. It's not just the instructor. There's lots of people. Having lots of people around, it you know, kind of is motivating, right? There's lots of people to compare yourself to, et cetera. And In this dojo, uh, the teaching is not just coming from the sensei or the master. It's coming from all these people that are working together. So I am both cooperating with and helping the people in the dojo, and I'm also competing with them. I see who's good. I see who's got a black belt. Maybe I've got a white belt, and I see who's good, and I want to get better. And so I'm, I'm competing and cooperating with them. Most opera reviews are neither cooperative nor really competing. Most people are doing emails in operating reviews and they wait till they hear their name called and then they, they respond. But if you do them right, if you put your employees in a position where they have to stand up in front of the group 
and present something, present how they're thinking about the project, present, um, you know, their red, yellow, green on their project status, project uh, a, or tell, talk about a success, talk about where they need help. If they can get up in front of each other and share and present, defend their arguments, handle questions. And if the employees that are listening cannot just be doing emails, but can be challenging, questioning, tossing questions at the person, giving feedback to them so that each of those individuals is more ready in the outside world or with other managers or other levels, I think that's a powerful developmental stimulus. A question on that, right? Because I think yeah. that's that's really interesting. And I sit occasionally in these meetings, right? And then you, you also can't help but pay attention to the interactions. And I find it really interesting. I think a, a lot of leaders really struggle to make those things, uh, to your point, constructive. Yeah. And I, I think especially in today's remote work environment, right, where people dial in via Zoom and go off camera, it becomes much harder to get like a, a pulse on Right? Where people are in this process, are they dialed in? Are they engaged? Are they learning from each other? Or are they just right, eating a sandwich and waiting for the call to be over? <laughs> yeah, it's not easy over Zoom. I, I'll give you that. Nothing is easy over Zoom in some ways. And some of it, you got to force a little bit. A couple ways you force. A couple ways you can force it are, first of all, um, especially at the beginning, is you can give your employees a template for what to present. So if Mary's going to get up and present, you could say, okay, Mary, I want you to list your priorities so that everybody can see what you're working on. Give us the red, yellow, green status. You know, tell us what you're worried about. Uh, tell us what you're doing about what you're worried about. And is there any place you need help? I mean, that might be a template. I'm not saying it should be, but that, that's an example of a template. And so if everybody is doing this, one of the things that happens is, well, maybe Mary's got a great way of presenting her stuff. I see how she's presenting. I'm going to do it differently next time. Mary's going to help me raise my game just by watching Mary in action, for example. And that's an example. That, that's what I'm talking about with this kind of dojo idea. And then you also might have to do a little forcing or nudging. Maybe, maybe more politically correct word is nudging. Uh, but you might have to nudge your employees to say, okay, after Mary gets done presenting, Let's go around and say, what'd you like about Mary's presentation? What'd you like about how she defended her argument? What did you like about her business case for the project? And what, what suggestions do you have for her? What's one suggestion you have for her? So you might have to, you know, nudge a little bit more, push a little bit harder until it becomes more natural for people to just get up and present and to give feedback. Okay. So intentionality, define success. Get in the dojo, meaning use everything as a learning opportunity. Use your team as as as, uh, as senseis to each other. All right, what's number four? Yeah, so number four is tell them your truth. This this gets to be the hard part. We're going to give feedback, right? And they say, I don't want to be judgmental, but it's all judgmental. <laughs> Everything, the business strategy is judgmental. The capital allocation process is judgmental. The good, better, best model that you developed is judgmental, right? Another leader can come along and say, that's not best. That's not even good, right? So they have a completely different standard that you might have. So it's all judgmental. And if, if you're trying to, you know, be a leader or a manager and not be judgmental, it's like trying to play football and not get, you know, grass stains on your pants. You know, it's, it's, not going to happen. You've got to be judgmental. So, okay, it's easy to say. I know it's hard, you know, when you have to continue to work with these people. Um, so what can make this maybe a little bit easier? The first one is the good, better, best model helps with these judgments, right? If I meet with you beforehand, Thomas, and I say, hey, here's what good looks like for your job. There's kind of three major, major dimensions. This is what good looks like on each dimension better and best looks like. And you say, yeah, I like it. I agree. We're aligned. Okay. Now, you know, we're at the end of the quarter and we're talking about the year and, you know, we pull out that template and we note some places where you were great, Thomas, and some places where maybe you were better and some places where you were good or it wasn't even adequate, right? We've already established the standard. 
So now when we're gonna, now we're talking about what happened, why wasn't it the standard we both agreed to, and what can we do about that going forward? So that that can help. Uh, another thing that can help is as the leader, you just have a different perspective than they do, right? You have more experience, different experience. You're at a different level. You're seeing things a little bit differently. And so not only do you see the developmental opportunities that they might not see, I often find that leaders see the gifts that employees have that they're not identified with. So that's, you know, you're just providing a different perspective on that, you know, and when you communicate it, just own it as your truth. It's not the capital T truth. That doesn't exist because if another manager comes in and takes over after me, he or she's going to have a completely different perspective on what the team is doing. They're doing the same stuff, but they have a different perspective on it because I don't think there's a capital T truth here. There's just your truth and you just own it as that. And I want to share one best practice here, which is really, really helpful at a number of levels. So after you've had this performance conversation, you talk about what they're great at, you know, where they did an outstanding job. You talk about uh, maybe some opportunities for improvement. Ask the employee to write you an email after the meeting. And in this email, they got to do three things. They got to say what they heard. So lots of times employees kind of go into an altered state in these performance conversations. So, you know, you could tell the employee in no uncertain terms what they need to get better at, but they don't hear it. They just hear, oh, Thomas thinks I'm great. That's all they heard. <laughs> or there's also employees that are very self-critical and you give them a bunch of developmental suggestions and that's all they hear. They didn't hear any of the good stuff. And you said lots of good stuff. So you ask the employee to say, tell me what you heard. Second thing you ask them to do it, or, or write, send to you is, what are you going to do about the feedback? What's your action plan? And the last thing is, what do you need from me to help you implement that action plan? So by, by taking this step, which most managers don't, but by taking this step, you make sure the employee got the message the good and the not so the developmental development opportunities you make sure the employee has a plan that puts the ball in their court on the development front and your role becomes how do i help you get to where you're trying to go i think that's a best practice let me stop there and see what you think about this fourth one tell them your truth do you think that's a bias that we have when it comes to these performance conversations that we're looking at as more as like a gap versus a uh, potential I, i'm going to agree and disagree with you so here's where I'm going to agree with you. I, I think we don't celebrate the good enough. I don't think managers spend enough time saying what they love about an employee, why they're glad the employee's on the team, what the employee is excellent at. I think a lot of managers are stingy, and we're going to talk about that when we talk about this generosity gene idea. I think a lot of managers are, are stingy. And they just focus on the gaps, to your point. So that's where I'll agree with you. Here's where I'll disagree. You know, uh, a lot of these jobs are complex. You know, if you're the quarterback, uh, you can't just be good at handing the ball off. You also have to be able to throw screen passes and throw the ball downfield. And just to say, well, oh, okay, well, I'm, but I'm great at handing off the ball. Well, we, we're not going to win the game if you just stand back there and hand the ball off. You've got to be able to pass. If we're putting together a good, better, best thing, mm -hmm. and we're going to find the places where you just shot the lights out, but there's going to be places, there's going to be opportunities for improvement, right? The military does after action reviews after a mission. They talk about what went well, and they also talk about, you know, hey, what could we have done better? So I think gaps are important. I don't think managers emphasize the, the good enough. Yeah. And I think the other thought that comes to mind is, it's also very dynamic, right? I mean, it, it's leaders change, strategies change. What was great one year is horrible the next year, right? So I think, right, we have these wild pendulum swings, right? Make yeah, those and, and I just don't think it's realistic to say, I'm just going to do the parts of the job that I love. I'm just going to yeah. do the parts of the job that I'm good at. That, let, let's say there's three or four dimensions to your job. One, one dimension to your job, Thomas, is something about your ability with spreadsheets and financial analysis, et cetera. And you say, hey, I'm kind of a marketing person. I'm a, you know, management development, change management guy, whatever. 
you know, then I got to go find somebody to do the financial spreadsheets and the business analysis stuff. I completely agree. I think there's also this idea of like, you got to do the whole job, not just the parts that you like, right? You yeah. And, and so, and, and I think there's a lot of other reasons why I think it makes sense to do the entire job versus just pick and choose. Yeah. Um, okay. So we got four, four. ingredients. No, no uh -huh. number five. I mean, gotta yep. be, it's got to be really good. It's got to be really yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> in some ways, the best for last. So, you know, sometimes managers put too much pressure on themselves. Like, oh, I got to develop these people. And even when you tell them, you know, hey, the employees develop themselves, they say, okay, okay, okay. But here's just one more piece of this. It's the manager's not doing the development. The job is. The job does the heavy lifting on the development front. So I was fortunate when I was still in graduate school, I was working at Honeywell's Management Development Center and I got involved in the study of managers in the organization, you know, from, you know, first level supervisors all the way up to directors and executives. And just, we asked them where their development came from. And it wasn't from a mentor. It wasn't from a coach, though that was a long time ago that I was in graduate school. So coaching wasn't as popular back then. Uh, it wasn't from a training class. People said it was the job over and over again. They said, I got put in over my head my manager trusted me to, to give me this thing. I was in over my head. You know, I got a lot of feedback. I got support, but I, I, I realized I could do it. And by figuring it out, that's how I got better. And that's how I was able to get promoted or, you know, go to the next level, et cetera. So the job does the heavy lifting. Back to our notion here. Okay. The job, the employee has to develop themselves. The job does it. What's the manager's role? The manager's role is to make sure the job is right. And so as you look across your people, you can't just look at who's busy. I want to look at who's stretched, who's out of their comfort zone. Everybody's busy. But is Thomas working on something? Maybe like, for example, Thomas, I, I mean, you've been doing this podcast. What are you in season six of this podcast now? Yeah, season five. Season, season five. five. Okay, season five. I imagine when you first started, it was like, gulp, what have I gotten myself into, right? And so I'm sure it was a lot harder at first. But now that now you got a rhythm to this thing and it you know runs like runs like a Swiss watch. When you first did it, it stretched you. So the manager's job is to look around and say, not just who's busy, but who's outside their comfort zone, who's doing things they haven't had to do before, who's asking for help, right? Those are good indications that the job is pushing them to grow. I love that because, as you know, that's been like one of my epiphanies in the last 20 years is that <laughs> uh, you put a good person into a poorly designed job and, and the job will win, right? And yeah. demotivate that person. Yeah. I 100% agree, but that gets me to the next problem, how to structure a, a job to that, that actually does develop people as they perform it. And that, that's why I'm glad you're doing the work that you're doing is helping them think through this and think about what that's like. But one kind of um, pointer towards this is, you know, if, if I'm your manager, Thomas, um, I look at you and I just say, are you doing the same things you were doing six months or a year ago? And probably at this point, this podcast is not as developmental for you. I mean, you learn things on the podcast, but the setting it up, running it, marketing it, getting the word out about it, answering questions, inquiries that you get as a result of the podcast. My guess is it's not as developmental for you. So probably if you know I were your manager, it's not that I want to discontinue the podcast, but I'd want to be asking myself, what can we give Thomas to do that he's not done before that's going to get him a little bit outside his comfort zone? Maybe it's public speaking, for example. I don't know. I'm, I'm I, I've seen you in action. I know you're good on your feet, but maybe that would be an example of something that would get you outside your comfort zone. I've been like rereading Drucker, and and one of the things that still amazes me is that he wrote in 1973, "You can't make the job of a manager big enough." In today's age, you kind of like have to read that sentence three times and, and wonder if there's a typo. In organizations, I don't think we're, we're that dynamic for the most part, and again, yeah. probably also not that intentional. In, in setting this up, that it accelerates the development. I also feel that there's a concern that if people grow too fast, if, if you really accelerate them, they become rock stars, they're going to get bored in 18 months, right? You're going to lose them and you're going to have to find another person. So I think in a lot of cases, also managers feel quite comfortable not 
to step on the accelerator. I think they do, but I think you're playing a dangerous game there. You know, it's like, what, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to you want to push and accelerate development and help them grow fast and, you know, take the chance that they might get bored, that the organization won't grow fast enough, that opportunities won't manifest quickly enough? Do you want to play that game? Or do you want to play the game where we kind of hold back, we're a little stingy, we don't encourage development. We don't encourage employees to be intentional. We don't share feedback. We don't get, create op review dojos. And then they get bored and quit. I think there's probably a good segue to the generosity Perfect. gene, right? Because I think that ties to the makeup of the manager. So tell us about the idea of the generosity gene. Yeah, I, I think about this generosity gene as a meta skill. There's lots of definitions of meta skills out there. I like to think about meta skills as the skill with which you apply a skill or the skill that you can use to multiply your skills, right? It's something above that helps you either execute on a skill that you have or increase the skills that you have. So for example, let's take a carpenter's job, right? Carpenters cut and assemble, right? That's one kind of skill, obviously, that carpenters need to have. So the skill is cutting and assembling. The meta skill is the attention to detail, right? Measuring twice, cutting once, or, you know, whatever goes in there to make sure that there's a precision so that we're not having to kludge the thing together after it's already been cut and, you know, we're trying to assemble it now. And another kind of meta skill might be collaboration. If you're a carpenter and you want to get more work, you got to execute with the other people on the team. You got to be able to, co- the other people that are building the house, let's say. So you got to be able to collaborate, and that's going to help you get more work and get more carpentry skills. So that's how I think about what a meta skill is. Now, this notion of generosity gene comes from Jack Welch. Now, now I know that Jack Welch's legacy is being revisited, and I understand that, and I'm not questioning that revisiting process. Um, But even if he was cooking the books, he had a lot of good ideas about leadership. And I think this is one of them. And this is one of them that, you know, people can relate to. So there's managers out there. You've probably worked for them. Others have worked for them that, you know, they are stingy. They're stingy with their praise. They're stingy with their acknowledgement. They're stingy with their increases and with their feedback, right? They kind of want to keep people down. They're threatened by people that are really skilled, right? They're threatened by people that might be better than them. They're awful. They're awful to work for. And if that's who you are, trying to develop your people, trying to do these five things that we talked about is gonna be really hard. But if you have this thing that Jack calls a generosity gene, which means you delight in the success of other people. You delight when they win. You delight when they grow. You delight when they sort of even outshine you and, you know, they get promoted. Maybe they get promoted over you or promoted into a job that you might be interested in. If you can get yourself to the point where you delight in the success of others, then applying these five things, it almost doesn't matter what you do. It almost doesn't matter because Let's say 10 years from now, I, I work, let's say I worked for you 10 years ago. 10 years from now, I'm not going to remember what you and I talked about in our performance conversations. I'm going to remember a feeling that I got from you, which is that you really cared about me and you cared about my development. So for me, the generosity gene is the meta skill by which you apply these five levers and it's going to really accelerate the whole process. I think that's really true. If you think right, people want to contribute to something that's bigger than themselves at the top of their game and develop themselves, so you're going to make different decisions. I like your point that if you don't have that generosity gene, maybe managing people is not <laughs> your thing. Right, right. right. That, that, Gordy Curfee, who you had on the podcast, and he's yeah. a friend and a colleague. We went to graduate school together. One of the questions he likes to ask uh, Thomas is he likes to ask people to make a list of all the people they've worked for, you know, since, I don't know, they were 25 or whatever and make a list of all those managers and then, and leaders. And he says to them, all things being equal. And of course they are not, but how many of those people would you work for again? And he says, it's rarely more than about a third and, and oftentimes less. So that means two thirds of the managers are somewhere between mediocre and terrible. And so to your point, 
There's a lot of people that don't have this generosity gene that are threatened, that don't delight in the success of others. They're just trying to succeed for themselves. And it's a good question about whether they should be leaders of people or not. So, okay, I'm sold. Pretend I'm a middle manager. I have a couple of direct reports. I got a team of, I don't know, 15, 20 people. How do I even get started? Good question. Um, so first thing is the five levers are not sequential. So you don't have to do the first one and then the second one, et cetera. So you can kind of jump in wherever the opportunity presents itself. That said, uh, one that I'd be thinking about starting sooner rather than later is that very first one, which is making sure that as the leader, you're communicating your development is your responsibility. I'm here to try to create opportunities for you, to provide feedback for you, to give you the support that you need to do that. So that very first one about asking the employees to be intentional about their development, right? So that they're marching towards something and you're providing structure, feedback, you know, coaching support as needed. I, I think that's that's a pretty good place to start. So that, that would be one that would come to mind. But uh, here's a slightly different angle to your question. And that is, what if you could only do one of the five? What would you do? And there, I think what my answer would be, it would be op reviews as dojos. I think when you get employees on their feet, presenting to each other, handling questions, uh, they're getting better at presenting. They're getting better at telling their story. They're getting better at handling questions. They're going to be better when they go out and talk to other people in the workforce. We create sort of a spirit of teamwork and helping each other out. Um, I think that is a very, very pop uh, po powerful lever. And as I said, if you can, you can get this process started with a template, just give people like a four-page PowerPoint. If if you use PowerPoint or a four blocker, or here's the things I want you to present about, and you can get them started, uh, you know, with some structure, and that'll make it easier for everybody to get to uh, to get up. I, I like this so much because it creates transparency. What is it that you're working on? How are you doing? You can't hide. Put your numbers up there. What's the red, yellow, green status on your projects? transparency and accountability, I think it's powerful for teams and I think it's powerful for um, catalyzing growth. And if I, if I could tell just one story, I love this story. So Alan Mulahy, right? He was at Boeing and he took over Ford in 2006. So he walks in there from Boeing, 2006. And Ford, I mean, Ford was a very, very hierarchical organization, very high bound very hierarchical, very traditional, you know, every executive had two or three secretaries, you know, it's, it's one of those kind of places. And keep in mind when Malahi walked into Ford, they were on track to lose $17 billion in 2006, <laughs> 17 billion. So he establishes this kind of op review as dojo. And it was every week, every Thursday, no matter where you were in the world, you, if you were on his team, you had to show up for this meeting and you had to put your charts up there. So he's a couple of months into the job and everybody puts their, these are my metrics. These are my charts. Everything was green, Thomas. Two months into the job, everything's green. They're on track to lose $17 billion. Finally, one person <laughs> puts a yellow on his chart. and people on the executive team heard he was going to do that and they said goodbye to him. They said goodbye to him because as soon as you admit that, you know, your career's over, you won't be here anymore. And when the guy said, this is yellow, there was a quality problem at a plant up in Canada. And when he put up that yellow chart, Alan Malahi applauded. He said, thank you. Now we got something we can work on. And they immediately started having a conversation about who can go up and who's got this quality problem, who's got an angle on this, who can go help him. Some of the functional leaders went up there. They solved the problem. The turnaround at Ford from Alan Malahi being there is one of the great corporate success stories you'll ever read. I have to smile because I had, I think, a similar situation with a client or some sort of assessment. And then uh, it was like three different business units. And... 
if you couldn't give them a different rating because then one would feel lesser than the other. And so it was right. just like, so we started talking about shades of green. To, to <laughs> see. Shades of green. I like that. So if people follow your mental model, right, uh, if they don't have one, right, maybe they have one, right, maybe they have different ideas. But if they were to follow your mental model and, and pull all these levers, I mean, what, what what could you achieve? What do you think they they, they should aspire to? Yeah. Well, I, I don't think there's any question. Like if you're doing op reviews as dojos, for example, skills are going to improve. People are going to get better. They're going to see what each other is doing and people are going to get better. So you're going to see skill improvement. I think, you know, back to our why is a function of X. I think if the skills are improving and people are getting better on their feet, better at you know, being transparent, managing things, I think outputs are going to start to improve. I mean, clients of mine that have told me that they've implemented some of these things have said, you know, they saw outputs improve quickly. I think the performance conversations are going to get a lot easier. If you've got that good, better, best model, you know, and you're using something like that, the performance conversations are going to get a lot easier. And a lot of people dread those performance conversations. So I think that's one thing that's going to happen. And, you know, my belief is, and, and this is probably aspirational, uh, and I don't know this for sure, but my guess is if you implement something like this and stay the course, um, your employees are going to write you letters long after they've worked for you, thanking you for how much they learned while they worked for you. I, I think that's true. And I think one of the reasons is because it's back to number one on your list, right? The employees got to own that development. Yes. Process. And as, a, as a leader, you can create the conditions. You can be intentional about doing this, but ultimately it's up to the individual to seize those opportunities. But they're probably much, right, much more inclined to do so if they have the choice to actually shape their own destiny. And own yeah. it. So, so I think that's really powerful. Yeah. And I think it's a very adult way of managing this versus, hey, I identified these five skill gaps, take these seven LinkedIn courses, report back in three months and present better. How can people learn more about your work? Um, where can people find additional resources? How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, my uh, website is Odsum Insights, A-D-S-U-M-I-N-S-I-G-H-T-S, Odsum Insights. That's where they can go. Uh, my three main you know, sort of offerings are, you know, first, executive coaching. Second is team building, organizational consulting work. And I also have a service first 100 days helping executives get off to a great start in their new jobs. Listen, Dennis, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking yeah. about the generosity, Gina. I really love the concept. I think it's a very practical uh, model that, that I can only recommend people give it a try. So thank you so much for coming on the show. And Thomas, I just want to say uh, thank you for having me. And also, you know, we've known each other for 30 years and I value, I value the connection we've had over the last 30 years. Likewise, my friend, likewise. We hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, be sure to subscribe, like, share, or comment. Until next time, let's make work matter.